I've been thinking about tone a lot recently and how when we change equipment, change gear, listen to different players, we talk a lot about our sound using words that don't really apply to sound, literally. So if I were to say that someone's tone was brighter or warmer, uh, Coltrane's got a fat sound, Sonny Rollins has a warm, round sound, uh, Brecker's tone really cuts like a knife. Um, it's all sort of, it's, it's about as unscientific as it gets because those words don't really describe uh, anything that's going on with the sound acoustically, but it does have a lot of meaning to us because we have sort of developed this language for talking about sound. Um, so what I wanted to do was use some of the tools that are available to us in the realm of audio recording um, I'm using a, some software called a spectral analyzer. So if you think about the sound of a clarinet compared to the sound of a saxophone playing the same note, you in the clarinet you're hearing a lot more of the fundamental. And here's some images of the spectral analysis of the clarinet and the saxophone. So with the saxophone, you can see there's a lot more presence in the upper partials of the sound. So what I wanted to do was really dig into saxophone tone. So what I did was I took a recording of John Coltrane and Sonny Rollins in an unaccompanied section of uh, some various recordings playing a concert G. So the first trick was to find some suitable recordings where I could get a sample of uh, John Coltrane and Sonny Rollins' tones playing unaccompanied. So I went for the cadenza on I Want to Talk About You. So a great example of Coltrane's tone without anything around it. And then Sonny Rollins, I used the intro a uh, small solo entry plays on You Do Something to Me. So I've got all set up in Logic here um, where I finally extracted the uh, concert G. Um, here's Coltrane. I slowed that down a little bit so we could hear the timbre a little better. And here's Rollins. Very different sounds, right? Here's Coltrane again. And Rollins. Alright, so um, I used this handy dandy harmonic series calculator. Thanks, Michael Norris. Um, I put in my note, and you can see the frequencies. 195 is the, is the fundamental. 391 is the double, and that's the uh, one octave up. That's the first, the, the first overtone, the second partial of the of that G. So um, I went ahead and labeled the ones that were strongest, or what looked like the strongest. Um, you can see that Coltrane's got a strong fundamental, and the second partial uh, is almost equal to the fundamental. The fourth partial, and here's the third partial, but the fourth partial is almost at that level as well. Then the eighth partial, um, that's my guess of what that is. It's hard to get any exact frequencies on this analyzer because of the way it labels the axes. But the eighth partial was my best guess. Um, very strong. So we've got um, a very strong presence in the upper mid-range, we might call it, for the saxophone. Um, and then it just tapers off slowly toward the kind of, a lot of this might be tape hits and things, but the tone is pretty much strong all the way ac across. He doesn't have any real gaps. Rollins, on the other hand, the fundamental strong, already by the time we get up to the second partial, it's almost half the volume of the fundamental. 
uh, which means the middle range, kind of the, the middle, maybe middle lower range of his G, of that timbre of that note, is a lot quieter than compared to Coltrane's up here. Again, it's pretty full right around 500. Rollins drops way down around 500, um, but then peaks back up again around the sixth partial and back down in between. So if you can kind of see around 2000, Rollins is pretty strong. Um, Coltrane is a little quieter there. It's really interesting to me that right here, of course, because it's the, the fundamental of the instrument, it's pretty much identical. I think this is just noise because the saxophone is not playing those notes. Um, but the way this Rollins, Rollins is uh, a lot less volume in the second partial, I think is probably a big part of the difference in sound. I made these boxes just so I could kind of see where the the bulk of the volume is. And when you compare this, I mean, Coltrane's got from 1K up to 4K, it's all around, peaking around minus 25 dB. Um, Rollins, from 2K to, I guess, about 7K, that's peaking around minus 35, a little quieter. Um, and at, at 2K, it's all the way down to minus 35. So, I think the most interesting thing again is that that second partial in Rollins' sound over here is much weaker. It's in, in this whole range from 250 all the way up to about 800 uh, hertz is a lot quieter when you compare that to the way Rollins, uh, Coltrane has this big um, bump there. It's it's pretty stunning, I would say, and you can and hear that again. Let's see, um, here's Rollins, and here's Coltrane. Okay, so if you made it this far, thank you for watching. Um, I think I went a little crazy in depth on that one sample, especially considering that they were from completely different recordings. <clears throat> Obviously different microphones, different um, acoustic spaces are going to change the actual results. I think if I do this again, I'm going to try um, finding some recordings of players that are maybe more comparable uh, in that sense. But I think this is an interesting methodology for looking into, at least in a um, you know comparative way, the difference between various players' sounds. And there's a lot of applications for us as saxophonists we can, for example, uh, play different equipment into a microphone with our own um, computer and use a similar type of software to see how our sound compares in a more concrete way than just saying, oh, that one sounded brighter, that one sounded darker. I think recording yourself with a different equipment is always a great way, absolutely necessary way to make a more objective decision about um, what you want to sound like and with a project like this one you could sort of even compare in a more concrete way what the equipment changes that you're using or different techniques that you're using how effective long tone exercises and things like that have been on your sound um, by comparing them to recordings of players who you like or players you don't like so um, leave a comment subscribe like the video Hope to make some more like this one soon.